Hi, I'm Dr. Chris Solano, Chief Editor of Dental Economics. Thanks for joining us for another edition of DE's Recall Visit, where we sit down with some of our authors from a favorite recent article in Dental Economics. And I'm joined here today by Dr. Brady Frank. How you doing, Brady? I'm doing great, Chris. How are you doing today? Excellent. Thank you. So you wrote a, a wildly popular and fascinating three-part series in our October, November, and December editions about the DDSO concept that you've created. So for those that haven't seen the, the series, can you just explain what is a DDSO? Absolutely. Well, all the craze lately, as you know, has been these DSOs expanding in our um, large, some, some people call them corporate groups expanding, oftentimes funded by private equity, right? And, uh, and that's okay. Um, but a lot of dentists are saying, hey, I'd like to take part in what's going on here. There's an expansion going on in dentistry and you know uh, the term investing in yourself is something that is ringing true with a lot of dentists and so a lot of dentists are starting to say you know if the big corporate groups can do it i've got a lot of special things i'd like to expand with too and so the ddso uh, concept is simply taking some of the best principles that the dso's are using bringing them into the private practice environment and using those for expansion as well in multi-doctor and even multi-location groups so the DDSO is the dentist owned DSO, which simply means um, you sequester off the management component of the practice from the clinical component because they're so true today that we can't possibly as solo practitioners, you know, lump that all together, many believe. And so they sequestered off creating a, a management LLC and a clinical LLC and the management LLC kind of takes part in that expansion. That's fantastic. And I know one of the things you touched upon in your first article, you're a firm believer that then the obviously the dentist can't be doing dentistry in all of these locations. Um, and so you, you, you talk about how you can bring in associates. But one of the keys that you mentioned is is actually bringing them in as co-owners at a certain point as well. Is that right? Absolutely. So about a decade ago, a little little over that now, I used to do a lot of lunch and learns at dental schools and have spoke to probably over 4,000 dental students about ownership. And, you know, I found out that only about six to 8% of dentists go right into ownership after dental school. But believe it or not, over 90% of dentists, their end goal is to be a private practice owner. And so there's a huge discrepancy right now of the actual vision of a dentist versus what they're actually being fulfilled with out of school. And so, so in my practices now, um, uh, what, what we do is add only owners because we believe dentists want to be the owners of their practice or their practice within a group. And so an associate is an employee with perhaps the, the least tax advantages and perhaps it's always a stepping stone to their end goal, like 90% of dentists have ownership. And a trial partnership is a little bit different or, 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 or trial ownership position is kind of the benefits of an associateship with the benefits of ownership. And so a trial partner is actually paid like a real owner in the practice day one. So instead of just their one stream of income, your, their 30% of collections or net production or whatever it is, instead of just receiving that, they actually receive four streams of income from day one. Their base income, their percentage of collections or net production, plus their management profits if they're going to help manage some of the bookkeeping the the hr some of the marketing whatever that might be a, a portion of that gdso revenue that can come monthly through a business support services agreement and then the final uh, or i should say the third component of revenue the profits if you're an owner in a practice you receive profits less a partnership payment, which will mimic the bank payment once they do become a true co-owner after the trial period. And then the fourth form of income that a trial partner receives is that which is not a tangible form of income, but it's the equity component. So if that practice is doing this much in gross revenue, and because of that trial partner coming aboard, it's doing this much, that is equity gain the trial partner come aboard is kind of solidified for their ownership part of the practice. Therefore, the growth that they work so hard to achieve is not just going in the owner dentist pocket, 
but the trial partner gets to partake in that practice growth or that equity. Just like if you bought a house a year ago, your house is probably worth more right now because of the equity appreciation. So a, a trial partner earns income four ways versus one way. And if you can figure that out as a practicing dentist, you're um, offering something of much higher value to a new dentist that you want to recruit to your practice. You know, it's a, it's a really interesting business model. And I love that it helps the entrepreneurial dentists out there that are looking to grow a little empire for themselves. But this is also a great way to share equity and inspire other dentists out there. So can you tell me, though, from your experience is for someone that's looking to build an empire of a few practices for themselves following this model, is there a very common or, or very nasty uh, mistake that some of these folks might make as they're starting to, to build their number of practices? Yes, I think the biggest mistake that dentists make in going out and starting with their one practice and buying another and another, or maybe they have three right now and they want to buy five more, is buying their practices at retail uh, value. Um, if, if you want to benefit your new dentist coming aboard and yourself, what I like to do is find practice acquisitions where the senior doctor has, is now in the regressive phase. And they've chosen because of life circumstance to cut back to maybe two days a week because they're okay financially. And so we have the opportunity to buy those practices, help the senior doctor out, help ourselves out by investing in dentistry and buying a practice that maybe used to be doing 800 and now it's doing 350 or something buying it for maybe 100 or 200,000, helping the senior doctor out because it's generally unfinanceable and it's oftentimes seller financing, getting in there and putting all your systems in place. And of course, at the conference, the DE conference coming up, a lot of the systems that we're gonna be learning from a bunch of different speakers, they're putting those in place, building that practice up. And that is where we earn our retirement savings, so to speak, and on that equity increase. So we've helped the senior, we helped the new dentist, and we've helped ourselves by investing in ourselves. So folks that buy a practice for too much money, all they can hope for is to get out of debt. But when you buy a practice in the regressive phase, which is part of the life cycle practice that we'll talk about coming up, we're able to have great investment returns and use our own money, have our own private equity company increase through help, help in other dentists. That's fantastic. So you mentioned the Principles of Practice Management Conference that's coming up July 12th and 13th in Indianapolis. And you're going to be, uh, I think you're kicking off our, our conference. I think you're the first speaker up. You'll be going into uh, more detail about your three-part series and, and all of those uh, concerns. Can you give us a little bit of a preview on what kinds of things we'll learn about? Absolutely. Um, we're going to be going uh, as deep as we can and packing as much information as we can into that lecture. And so what we're going to be doing is kind of showing how a lot of practices are splitting their practice up into the business and the clinical side. And the business side has to have a bunch of value, okay? And so when that business side is now managing your clinical practice or two or three practices that you might buy as investments, investing in dentistry, um, there needs to be sufficient value for uh, that management LLC to receive income from the practice for its services. So we're gonna be going over seven uh, different streams of income and value that the typical DDSO um, imparts on the clinical practice. So we're gonna be going over dental sales plans. There's a big craze with in-house plans going on, how people are automating those through software, how people are marketing those with Facebook, uh, Facebook Pixel, pay-per-click and all that, and reducing their marketing budgets, but bringing a lot of people in, retaining them with a lot more new patients. So we're gonna be talking about that. We're talking about some in-house financing plans when your patient's not approved through, say, Care Credit or one of the other third parties. And I love Care Credit. I love the other third-party financers, but they may only approve up to three thousand dollars. But what if it's a six thousand dollars treatment plan? What happens then? So we go over that whole uh, uh, that whole ecosystem. We're going to be going over building your own wholesale dental lab. As you have a few locations, it makes sense to build a lab, but not necessarily to buy all the equipment and all that but to develop vendor relationships based on a volume pricing schedule. So having a lab that is based on wholesale purchasing at the top quality within your DDSO is another thing we're talking about recruiting. How do you recruit um, the best and brightest talent, new dentist to your practice? And so I've written a couple books and I'm helping 
probably about 18 dentists right now who own groups write a book on you know getting into ownership and this book teaches them a lot of these concepts and prepositions them to want to be an owner rather than wanting to be a lifelong associate and so we're gonna be going into that writing a book we're also gonna be going into the many strategies for marketing for new patients because if you buy a practice in the regressive phase that might be seeing eight new patients a month you've got to bring it back to the startup phase and have a new phase of growth so we'll be talking about that as well so it's gonna be a smorgasbord it's gonna be fun and uh, i hope we get through all the material i'm sure we will but uh, yeah it'd be fun to see any of you watching at the uh, conference oh and and sharpen your pencils that's a that's a ton of material i know i'll be in the front row with my notepad taking a lot of notes so uh, dr Br <laughs> taking the time with us and we'll see you in indianapolis hey thank you so much thank you so much chris have a great day thanks take care